Um, also, I, I will take this moment for those of you who may not, um, who were, who got on the phone, but we just sent an email out. If you're not aware, the grant and aid bill was uh, with the Delaware State Senate yesterday, and unfortunately, it was voted down. So um, after this session, I'd encourage you to reach out to your uh, Delaware Senator to um, ask them to consider uh, revisiting the grant and aid bill. Um, as many of you know, that's an important bill that funds uh, many services in Delaware that nonprofits provide, and uh, we want to make sure that um, they're aware of how important that funding is. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you here today. Just thank you all for offering your, your um, input on your outcomes and, um, and what organization we're with. We have over uh, 100 folks that are on the, on the webinar right now, and um, we will send this uh, PowerPoint presentation out to you so that you can reference it again in the future. So today we're going to start off with just an overview of the COVID-19 Strategic Response Initiative. Uh, share with you uh, a little bit about some of the things that we've learned in the process of the last couple of weeks around community needs, and then take, take you through an overview of the vision grant and then uh, wrap it up with, with questions. So a little bit about the Strategic Response Initiative, if you're not familiar with this, this is really a, a fabulous collaboration with the Delaware Community Foundation, Philanthropy Delaware, the United Way of Delaware, and Dana, uh, the Delaware Alliance for Nonprofit Advancement. We were very quickly able to uh, outline a response to support um, the tremendous impact that we were seeing with the pandemic. And there was a variety of different components to it. The first was uh, gathering information so that we'd understood what the needs were. We uh, tapped 211, which is an existing um, uh, call center, to not only uh, capture the increased demand and requests for food and financial assistance, but also to use it as a platform to identify needs that nonprofits had, as well as to recruit volunteers who could um, provide additional support. And um, so it was a pretty impressive number of folks that, that raised their hand to help out with that. Um, Dana, our role was to provide information to the United Way and Philanthropy Delaware and the Delaware Community Foundation as they were raising money to, uh, to be able to provide financial support to nonprofits providing services in the community. There were two different types of fundraising initiatives that were implemented. The United Way had a, uh, implemented a what's called a rapid response initiative that was targeted towards providing critical services to uh, eight select agencies that were working across the state. And then they've since evolved to expand that to a broader list of partners that provide critical services across the state. And then the second is the Strategic Response Fund, which is managed by Philanthropy Delaware and the Delaware Community Foundation. And they were focused on um, what I'll call sustaining issues. What we found out very early on is that the, the, the impact of the pandemic with the tremendous amount of job loss, schools being closed, that there needed to be um, even more critical service support than what the United Way's uh, fund could do. And so in the first couple of weeks, the Strategic Response Fund really focused on those critical needs impacted by the, um, the pandemic. Over the past several weeks, then beyond that, the fund started to evolve and uh, provide a broader level of support. And what we're gonna talk to you about today is how the fund is evolving again. I think that's one of the things that I'm really so impressed with the philanthropy community is how they recognize that this is a changing situation. And so the donors who are providing support to these funds, which by the way, are not just foundations, but also private donors that have contributed they recognize that we wanna be responsive and that things may change. So um, what we're gonna share with you today is kind of that next evolution. And always keep in mind that um, depending on what happens in the future, there may be a pivot again. I do also wanna give a shout out to a parallel initiative that emerged out of this. And that was uh, providing funding support to underwrite 
um, loans that could be dedicated for nonprofits to access that um, small business associations, administrations, PPP loans. And they were, um, they were uh, worked with us and we were able to provide over $10 million of um, SBA funding in a very short period of time. Um, Dana, we, uh, through volunteers, were able to help um, over 80 nonprofits apply for PPP support, either through the, the NDC program or with other banks. And I think the other thing that we um, contributed to this was really to provide um, helpful webinars and information, and we continue to do so. Again, everything continues to evolve. And so um, I'm sure you've all experienced this, that uh, where we were three months ago and where we are today, um, we're in very different places around community needs and how we respond. And most likely three months from now, there'll be some changes as well. So Cynthia, I'm gonna let you take um, the, the lead. And I'd like to introduce, if I haven't done this before, for those who've joined us in the last uh, few minutes, Cynthia Pritchard is the CEO of the Philanthropy Delaware and has served as a partner with Dana on many initiatives and um, is a partner with uh, me today as we host this webinar. So Cynthia, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking your time to be with us today. So um, the role that Philanthropy Delaware has played is not just the, our members being critical investors in these funds, but also um, Philanthropy Delaware sitting as the director with um, the fund that is housed at the Delaware Community Foundation has provided significant support around managing this fund. So the COVID-19 Strategic Response Fund um, from grants from March to June 5th have been given to over 300 nonprofits. We've had over 20 million in requests, as you probably could imagine, and have awarded 3.4 million. We know that the need is great, and we clearly understand, obviously, with $20 million in requests that we can't meet it all, but we have to start thinking strategically as we move forward. As you can see, if you look at the pie chart, um, the variety of types of organizations we have funded. Um, I always talk that this chart, this chart has changed over time. When we were really in the beginning in the community needs space, you could see that the human service sector was a much bigger slice of the pie. But as we've moved forward and progressed, and as organizations have progressed throughout the, the, their trajectory through this process, we see the pie being a lot more of a variety and really reflective of the nonprofit community in Delaware. So we're really proud to be able to look at this and say that we are funding across the, sec sec across the sector. Um, I see from Maria, I know it's hard to read, but you're going to get the slides where you can blow it up a little bit um, and we get that. But when you have, um, you know, up to 25 different types based on the NTE codes of nonprofits, that's like, it's going to be small. Um, other things to really make note of is grants by location. Um, as you can see that, um, you know, there was um, a Newcastle County, Wilmington obviously was some of the biggest slice. Kent County and Sussex County also getting a portion and other 1% and those are organizations that may not be housed in Delaware, but serve in Delaware. Just so that you know, every dollar that was given out of this fund was for Delawarean residents for programs that serve Delawareans. Um, that being said, we also know that Wilmington is going to look like a slightly, slightly bigger slice, just the amount of organizations that are based in Delaware geographically, um, you know, based on their locality. I also want to note that one of the investors in this fund was Newcastle County that put a significant amount of dollars in the fund. So there was definitely knowing that we were utilizing those funds to serve Wilmington and Newcastle County. So the strategic response fund grants program continues to evolve. Um, in the beginning, um, we were doing weekly grants. Um, for, you know, I'm very proud, you know, Sheila talks about her pride in this program, but when um, Philanthropy Delaware, Delaware Community Foundation, Dana and United Way got together very quickly, um, the four leaders, um, Sue Comstock Gay, Sheila Bravo, Michelle Taylor, and myself have worked together. We meet on a regular basis, so it was very easy for us to come together to do this collective. And, you know, from the day we started these funds to when money was out on the streets was very quick and very rapid. And we were doing weekly grants that was literally receiving applications on Monday and money was being ACH into nonprofits accounts by Friday. Um, we know that now things are calming down a little bit and we are moving the, the community needs grants to monthly. And those are really for sustainable organizations impacted by COVID-19 
with a $50,000 max grant. The vision grants, which we're going to delve in a little deeper today, are every other month, and they're really about funding innovative solutions for community impact. There is no max on the grant, but as I talk about the different phases, you'll start to understand where the dollars come into play in all of this. But knowing full well that we know community needs are still going to exist, even as we start to move into the vision grants. So what is, what is the vision grant program outcomes? So we're looking for innovative solutions to address systemic issues. We're really looking at multiple agency partners to create catalytic impact and to mergers where greater outcomes be, can be achieved more efficiently. Um, the way I like to look at it is we're looking at what, what are the systems that individuals engage and in, how can those systems work together more efficiently and effectively to serve those individuals, but at the same time doing it in a way that is thoughtful around the work of each one of those organizations. Criteria for grant consideration. Um, for a vision grant, it has to be outcomes oriented with clarity around impact and the community benefit. How is it benefiting the community as a whole? Innovative solutions for issues identified because of COVID-19 or were exacerbated by the pandemic. We know in this time, organizations started to work differently, but they also started to work together differently. So how can we take advantage of these new creations and put them into better long-term solutions? Collaboration with boards of directors on all participating organizations signing off on the initiative. This is really important. Um, we know I've run nonprofits. I technically run a nonprofit right now. There's ideas that come into my head on any given day that I think, oh, let's go do that. But it really isn't. It really does not make any sense without the board of directors being on board with being engaged in this process. They have to be buy into any one of these vision grants for them to be successful and for them to even be considered. Lead organization with the leadership capacity to manage the initiative. Um, there are going to be a lot of moving parts and there's going to be a lot of expectations. So that lead organization has to have the capacity in order to lead the project. And identified method to fund collaborative post the vision grant initial investment. This isn't the end all be all for funding. What it is, is it gets you in a position to leverage funding and this is, and the funding community or the philanthropic community um, should not be your only funding source. You know, it's really about bringing dollars together to move effective change and how you're going to do that, not just in this grant cycle, but beyond and how it is sustainable beyond the initial investments. So let's talk about what we consider um, the funding focuses. We look at these vision grants in sort of three buckets. The first is that big idea. Um, as I had a conversation that Sheila was on yesterday, what is that big idea or that big problem you're trying to solve? What is that and what, what would it take to get there? In the first discovery phase, it's really taking that big idea and exploring it to maybe be feasible. What, what, what is sort of a scope of work? What could it be? The second level is feasibility, which is research and planning. The big idea now has a um, project scope, but there needs to be a deeper dive, whether it's um, what are the legal ramifications, what are the fiscal responsibilities, and actually putting together a full plan. And then the third is implementation and launch. This is where the funders come around the table for potential long-term, larger investments. This is done in a panel um, model, and we'll dive deeper a little bit into that. But this is where the funders come around the table with the intention of investing in this project. So how the process works. Um, Dana is really engaged in this process and we're thrilled to have them as a partner. We've been thrilled to have them as a partner in the beginning about the sort of taking this big idea and bringing it into something that actually has some legs to it and has some structure to it. Um, they will be doing some facilitation along the ways in the process. So what will happen is if an organization is interested in bringing an idea forward, they submit a letter of intent or request for investment. Um, those documents are housed on the Delaware Community Foundation site and th that will be referenced later in the document. Once the um, letter of intent is received, then it is determined whether that project is ready to go to application phase. When it goes to application phase, then it gets, when that application is received, 
is when it would get be put in either one of those three buckets that I talked about. Is it still a big idea that needs some more formation? And if it does, Dana will work on helping the organization create that. Is it in feasibility or what we call planning stages? And that's where you would work with a technical assistance, a consultant around building a plan that's investable. And then there is the, the implementation or the investor panel. All along the way, there is open dialogue, conversation and assistance through Dana and through um, <clears throat> those that are managing the fund to sort of help you even talk through it, whatever that may be. Um, it's really about trying to get your idea to be an investable project and something that can be implemented in Delaware. Sorry, I got, uh, I was trying to watch the chats. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So just to give you some ideas to sort of see how these, how these buckets work and, and where types of projects have fallen into them. So ideas that are already currently in the pipeline. So the first one was online summer school programming. It was making digital programming available to students. This one went before the funders panels because it was implementation ready. The project plan had been written, the feasibility had been done, and pilots had already taken place with some outcomes so that it was ready to be invested and had a plan that could launch right away. So it went before the funders panel for investment. Closing the digital divide. It's a project around um, sort of the digital divide piece um, around making sure that every Delawarean has access to internet, whether it be not just the towers, the wiring, but also Wi-Fi available in a way that's affordable for every individual and covering including all the dead spots across the state. This is in the planning phase. The organization is currently working with a consultant, a technical advisor to help build an implementable plan that takes into consideration all the funding sources, the legalities, who the key partners are, what the roles and responsibilities of everyone is in that organization to bring it before the funding panel. The third one is to reduce homelessness. And right now they are currently in the big idea phase. They are working with um, Delaware Alliance for Nonprofit of Annette's Dana on building sort of that scope of work um, or a project plan that is ready to go to a technical advisor and a consultant. Other collaborative examples that have sort of been in discussion. One is strategic partnerships for multiple organizations for back office, sharing to reduce admin costs and increase program outreach impact. You know, Share, what can you do to sort of save costs? Are there services that you're buying? You know, we look at sort of the collective buying methodology of, you know, what if you all bought your paper together? What if you shared um, a bookkeeper? What could that look like? What, and a strategic partnership for multiple organizations. That's one sort of idea that is very impactful because it does save costs over time. But what it also does in sort of the bigger picture that I always think about is it also creates program re outreach impact because organizations are working with, together in ways they've never worked together before. And if they're organizations that share clients or share similar types of clients, there is an opportunity to even share programs across that sort of collective. Overcoming the digital divide for other populations or issue areas. So we know that we're covering digital divide in one area, but then the other piece is how do we work on maybe content build? What if several organizations got together to do a content build around a particular area? Creating capacity to spark innovation and entrepreneurship for small business owners. How do we work in tandem? You know, what's the nice thing about the vision funds, it can be a public-private partnership, so it can be businesses as well as nonprofits working collectively together. And how do we do that? And how do we work, you know, how do we create models in which they can, that can happen, that sort of innovation and entrepreneurship? Improving access of population to comprehensive social services, reducing difficulty in securing that support. You know, this has been done in other places across the country, and it's really looking at an integrated referral system where clients are not the ones that have to navigate systems, that they have navigators that help them navigate resources. There's nothing worse than when you're in a crisis and you go to a door and it's not the right door. How do we help clients move from one to the other. A model that's been done with this, it's called No Wrong Door, it sits in aging services. It's around whatever agency you walk into, it's never the wrong agency, because that agency can provide you direct access to potentially another agency and not having to repeat your story and your case over and over and over again. Um, creating a racial equity, social justice informed agenda that can be applied across multiple initiatives. 
you know, obviously we're in unique times. How do we do that in a way that can work with multiple organizations and not just one organization taking, I'm doing my social justice agenda, but how can we take a social justice agenda that could, pre could be extrapolated across multiple organizations and implement in a way that's thoughtful, collective, and really starts to get at root causes. And we don't just have one-offs that we're actually dealing with equity and social justice for the long haul in ways that help move us forward for that community. And Cynthia, there's been a couple questions raised around um, if there's an existing initiative that's already uh, starting up, how do nonprofits that might be um, interested in, in that collaboration, how do they get connected? Well, if they would reach out to us, we would um, connect them to the lead organizations that are managing those projects. It's pretty easy. And, and, and I would add that, you know, from a Dana perspective, you can also ask us, and if we don't know yeah. the answer, we'll send you to Cynthia. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody's, and the nice thing about it is that there is this collective response in such a way that if you called Sheila and said, I'm looking, I'm interested in the digital divide, we want to be part of that, we all know, we know where to find who's leading these projects. And that's the nice thing about this collaborative, because there's a significant amount of open communication among all of us that are playing, that are working in the space to make sure that ultimately we're trying to serve the nonprofit community the best. Right. Let me see. There's might be another question here. Um, so there's a question about, would that be a, a sub-award situation, or would we submit another application to further support the program? Um, it would not be another application. It would be probably included in their collective, and it wouldn't be a sub-award. There would not be additional dollars that would be joining that partnership. It would be being a partner within that. Yeah, I, I think the one thing to keep in mind is that we are – we don't know exactly what will come forward, but, but the intent is that the agencies that are coming forward have already spent some time sorting through who the partners are. And depending on which phase they come in, definitely in the last two phases, the, the feasibility and the implementation, the expectation is that those agencies have signed some type of agreement that they're going to work together. So the, the tricky part is um, you want to make sure that you have all the right uh, folks around the table, but it also can be um, almost difficult to implement if you end up with too many, right? So I think that's, the, that's something to keep in mind um, as you're reflecting on potential opportunities. Uh, Dana is offering a webinar, uh, I believe it's next week, or maybe it's the following week, um, on collaboration and things to consider um, as it relates to how your organization and those that you might partner with, what are some of the, the things to keep in mind with a, a collaboration? Uh, so there's another question, Cynthia, that came up before we move on, and it's somebody who did try to log on to the website to apply for the vision grant, and they're asking the question, is the application in the portal the full application or the LOI? And if it is the full note, not the LOI, is there another template for that? So it is the, right now, the only thing that's active is the LOI, the letter of intent, the application will be by invitation only. Right. And another request came, question came up, is multiple or dual collaboration essential for funding? Or can a nonprofit be considered for funding on its own? So the answer is highly unlikely. <laughs> Um, it's really about organizations working together. Um, it's it, typically it's not going to be one organization solo. That would have to be an extreme exception for that to be considered. Yeah, and I think that you know, having listened uh, to the to the planning process and 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 as as this was being developed, it was really recognizing that COVID nineteen um, has really uncovered uh, inequities and gaps in the system, and so this is recognizing that most likely those inequities and those gaps are not easy fixes and no one organization probably can fix it on their own. And that's why the, the collaborative intent is, is brought forward at a, at, a, at a much higher level than perhaps you might have seen with other, with other grants. Um, so we actually did try to come up with a couple of questions that we thought folks would ask. So, um, Maybe I can take a stab at some of these, Cynthia, and then, and then you can jump in. Um, so the first one is around, you know, so how do you get started? Um, we have found that um, already, even as Cynthia mentioned earlier, there's already been some ideas that have emerged 
um, that represent the, the kind of opportunity for uh, uh, creating better outcomes in our communities collectively. But it may be that your organization has an idea or a couple of you think you've got something, but you need some help to kind of wrap around and, and really articulate what, what this is. And so on the Dana website at the very top, it says um, support for COVID, um, the vision grant. And so you can click on there and you can request some support. But also um, if you think you're, you've got it and you, you wanna submit it into that letter of intent, the, the fund will review that. And if they think that you need a little extra work, they may recommend um, that you get some extra help. And again, that's, that's some support that Dana can provide. Um, if you have the big idea, you know what you need to do, but you are um, you, you need some extra help, um, perhaps consulting services, or maybe you need somebody to help uh, price things out. Um, that also can be an opportunity. Um, earlier on, as Cynthia mentioned, there's these three phases of the grants, and and these the grant funding is really to help provide some of the capacity funding that you need to get to the next stage. Um, so it's, it's really assisting you through this process, um, recognizing that organizations and collaboratives will be at, at different levels. And that's really where, you know, okay, you have the idea, we've got the plan, but now, you know, how do we get the investors around the table? And Cynthia, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that and, and the investor panel. And so, yeah, and I will as I sort of, um, and I, 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 when I went through the different phases, so again, the, the, in that discovery phase, that is work that's done with Dana on facilitating that big idea. In the planning stage, again, where the funding comes in is the funding is for a consultant or a technical advisor within the parameters of what the appropriate pricing for one is. It can be a consultant that you can take advantage of the consultants um, that Dana has available, or if it's a specialty or subspecialty area, that you need a consultant that has done work like this before, that it can be a consultant that of, you, of the group's choosing. Or if you are replicating a national model and part of the consultant piece will be around um, working with that national model and they have a group of technical assistants that will help you build that plan, it might help you work with that national organization and give you funding around replicating a national model. When you get to the investor panel, how the investor panel works is there is a council that will review and determine whether something is ready to go before the investment panel. It doesn't go to the investment panel until the council feels it's an investable product and that there's probably already some economic buy-in into, into the project. Um, and then it goes before the funding panels and the, um, the panelists themselves know that they are coming to potentially invest in the project if it aligns with their corporate investment model, if it aligns with the work that they do, and if it's investable based on the portfolio that they are allowed to invest. And they come with the idea of investing. The hope is by the time the panel has seen the project that it is fully, it is funded in the way to at least pilot it, implement it, or scale it. Um, and Cynthia, there's a question that came up around whether or not in each phase there's a different application process. Can you talk a little bit about, let's say, let's say a collaborative comes in and they get some support to work on the big idea and now they have it. Are they able to come in and what's that process look like the second time? So um, they would go through the application process again and brought in to be reviewed for the next phase. Because Dana has been involved in the beginning, um, it's going to be based on their recommendation if they, if they, for them to come back in, that they are ready to come in for the next phase. And if they're working with a technical advisor, the same thing. To go from that planning stage to the implemental or investment phase, you do have to come and do the application again. But you'll see as you get, if we, if you're ever invited to do the application, you will see that the application as you move through the phases becomes significantly easier because you will have answered all the questions of the application as you built your plan. Thank you. There's another question that came up around um, who is on, who's on the investment panel? The investment panel are funders across the state, every from everywhere from corporate to foundation funders um, that fund in Delaware and fund in Delaware at a pretty high level. And they could also potentially oh, be- Oh, the investment panel. So the investment panel is, excuse me, 
the investment panel, sorry, I thought you were asking about council, my apologies. So the investment panel consists of all the um, 50 members of Philanthropy Delaware, which are all um, investors, whether they be at corporate, is invited. Um, the donor advice fund holders at DCF are invited to be around the investment panel and government is also invited to be around the investment panel. So we brought sort of what are the three largest investors? There's going to be high individual network donors, foundations and corporate pro giving programs and government are the three largest investors and they are all invited around the table to be potential investors in any one of these projects. Yeah, and I think that's what's really exciting about this, that this is not just about collaborative service improvement or collaborative effects to improve community. There's also collaborative funding so that we can really try to, you know, see how we can maximize um, dollars and interest. And I, you know, having, though I personally have not um, applied to the big campaign fit panel that Philanthropy Delaware coordinates, it, from what I understand, it's a great way to have all of all the folks at the table so they can hear each other's questions. So it also makes it a little more efficient for us when we're trying to apply for for this. And Stu made a comment and I will and he wrote it to the group, but I, I again I will reiterate what Stu said is absolutely correct. The panel may vary depending on the project. Um, as I said, it's does it align with the potential investment of that particular organization's corporate social responsibility or that foundation's investment area, or if government has to be a critical player in order for it to happen, do they need to be around the table? So the panel could, there could be a variety of different people depending on the project that's brought forward. Obviously, when they're invited to participate in the panel, they get a precursor of what the project's going to be and will determine whether it aligns and whether they should be in the panel or not. And then- Thank you. Thank you for that. There's another question that came up around uh, the lead agency and whether there would be funding support to give provide the lead agency the capacity to serve as a backbone or coordinator for the for the initiative. I mean, I think that's where we get in the technical assistance is really um, really working with them to how that they can build their capacity and doing that. That's why that sort of center phase or that planning and feasibility phase is in there. If you really as the lead agency feel you can lead they're going to take you through the process of what is necessary for you to do that and determine the capacity. When you go obviously into the funding, if you're looking to implement a project, you have to consider the capacity of your roles and responsibilities and that should be part of the investment in, in the presentation. Great. Um, another question came up, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg question, which is around um, formulating the, the plan or the, the proposal for the letter of intent part. And the question is, does Dana help you formulate your plan after the LOI is accepted for application? Or are you saying Dana will help you create your LOI before your big idea? Um, I think we may find that it's an and, but you know, this will be the first time where we're going through the process. So um, we are, we, that's why we've created a interest form on our site. So if there's a, a group that needs some extra support and you, you need some assistance to get you to the LOI that we would take a look at that. And certainly we would consult with um, Philanthropy Delaware and the Community Foundation to determine if it makes sense for us to support you before you actually submit to LOI. Or it may be, you know what, we can give you a couple pointers, submit to LOI, and then at the panel, the council agrees, then, then they send it back. Cynthia, would you have anything to say on that? No, I would agree. If the LOI is submitted and the council determined that's in the discovery phase, then it's going to go to Dana to help work through that process. So yes, chicken and egg, you're right. <laughs> um, there was also a question about um, if we're not yet aligned formally with a collaborating organization such as NoMU, can we still submit an LOI for a big idea? So this is kind of before they formulated the big idea. They're just trying to come together to, to, to pull it together. Well, if, if, they, if you don't have contractual memorandums of understanding, but you have verbal agreements, again, what you may happen is you submit an LOI, and if the idea is selected by council to move forward, you may, you will probably end up in that sort of discovery phase, because you don't have those, because part of that planning phase is creating those legal contractual agreements, creating all the roles and responsibilities. So that happens in the planning and feasibility stage. You don't have to have it before you come in. But what I would say, you don't want to make the assumptive that 10 organizations are going to be around the table that you haven't even had a verbal discussion. Right. 
Um, I, I flipped to the next slide because there were a lot of questions about timeline. Um, there's a recognition that the first round letter of intent is June 26th. This is our second session that we've held, but also to keep in mind that there will be ongoing um, application rounds. And Cynthia, if you want to speak to the, the timeline process. So we will be running this cycle every other month. Um, so we will do be doing it July. It'll happen again in September and um, <clears throat> November, as of right now. Um, the letter of intent is due, due on June 26th. You will, will be notified on July 9th if you are going to move forward and we are requesting an application or if we are saying it's not even ready for application. Um, you have from July 9th to July 23rd to complete your application. Applications are reviewed between July 23rd and you will be notified on July 30th um, whether you fall into dis discovery, planning, implementation, or none of the above. And, and if I recall that one of the reasons for moving forward with this was quickly was just recognizing there was already initiatives that were starting to get outlined but would need some extra support to help them begin to formulate it. So um, the council wanted to, to get something out early, but then also recognize that there will be other opportunities. And some of, it may take a little while, for example, between the um, identifying the idea, but also then working through a plan. So recognize that you don't have to have all this buttoned up in a three week period. You wanna make sure that um, it's, it's thoughtful so that um, when you you do get to the investment panel phase, you, you've really um, ticked and tied and, and pulled the plans together that you need. I saw a question from Maria <clears throat> that asks, who's making decision on what LOIs are being forwarded to application? And that is the council. The council, which is made up of a group of funders, will receive um, each application, what the intent of the application, they will receive a narrative around the LOI and they will determine which ones get invited for application. Great. Um, one of the things the council did decide early on is that it was important that um, participants had attended uh, this session, the, the one previously, or we are holding a third one in August. And we also are recording these so that if somebody misses it, they still have a chance to, to hear um, the opportunity. And again, it's really so that those who are interested in applying are prepared to apply. One of the things we learned with the Paycheck um, Protection Program loan application is that nonprofits got stuck in getting their applications through the SBAs because they weren't prepared to bring forward all the information that they need to so that they could be successful. And I think that that's a way to think about it in this frame is that um, we, want, we want to have the opportunity for success, but it means being prepare it up front, knowing what, what things you need to be prepared to respond to and, and offer up. So that way when the, the panels, then the council looks at it, they have all the answers in front of them to make, to make their decisions. I think I'm looking at the questions to see if there's, I think we've addressed them all. Please note this is not the end of your ability to ask questions. If you have any additional questions coming out of this that you think of after the fact, please feel free to email Sheila or myself. Um, and if we don't have any reporter, them on to Stuart Allison at the Community Foundation to sort of help us answer that. But we ultimately um, want to make sure that your questions are answered. We know we're looking at about a, a small 48 hour window here. So um, feel free to ask them and we will get back to you expediently to make sure that you have the answers to the questions you need in order to move forward. Knowing that this is an ongoing, you know, we have it scheduled out to the end of the year. Um, as we start to see what happens with all this, we know that innovation doesn't happen in bubble. And we know that um, coming out of COVID-19, there will be ongoing changes, ongoing reflections as we look into 2021. And so um, I know that the council is committed to do this as long as we feel innovation is moving forward and that there are things that are happening that can actually make systems more efficiently and effective for Delawareans. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Stu's, Stu's popping in. We're getting some visuals here. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought I'd try to bring in Stu to see if he wanted to say anything um, since he's been 
quietly sitting in the in the audience, so to speak. I'm just listening. Can you hear me? Sue, can yeah. you hear me? It's a little louder. A little louder? Yeah. Okay. How's that? Does that work? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Three, one, two, one. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, um, uh, Sheila and Cynthia. Great job, of course. And really, um, we all are excited about the opportunity to provide support to the great initiatives we've been hearing about from you all. And, um, you know, I think that both Sheila and Cynthia set this up well, recognizing what we all recognize that the next normal is going to be different than this normal. And as we're entering this period of return to something, and we also are entering a period of reimagining something. And uh, we know you all have great ideas. And with this project, the goal is to, for the funders to, in some part, get out of the way and give you some resources to create them. Um, so we're trying to do this in, in the most productive way possible. Um, and uh, uh, Cynthia and Sheila obviously playing the key role right here. You can also you know, check in with us um, and we can help provide some guidance on this as well. Um, but but uh, the council, the um, what do we have? Eight of us on the council um, uh, are looking at, are excited about getting great ideas. And and the other thing I would say about all this is, you know, come back to us with other ideas. Keep you know, it, it may not happen for you this time, but that doesn't mean the ideas aren't don't have value and and may not be able to find another place. So let's just uh, keep the conversations going. So um, and uh, obviously Dana. Uh, we've contracted with Dana on some of this to really help provide some of the uh, handholding and training and capacity building along the way. So, good stuff. Thank, Thank you, Stu. And Thank you, Stu. And I, I just would say that this is our opportunity as nonprofits and philanthropy to really um, to to work together. Um, and and so I I hope that um, just just recognize that. We may not get it all perfectly right, exactly the right the first time, but how do we how do we keep trying and how do we keep working um, harder? There is a question, Cynthia, that came up um, around: um, Would would the Vision Council consider supporting or scaling and expanding or expanding an existing collaborative? So, what I would say to that is, if the collaborative, because these funds were based on investments around COVID-19. And if the collaborative was just an ongoing collaborative that's not shifting, changing, or pivoting to address how their clients were affected by COVID-19, I would say probably not in this first cycle, but please know that we want innovation. As Stu said, we want people to imagine, reimagine, and be innovative like they never have before. And we're giving um, a platform on which to do that. But I would know in this initial onset that we're really looking at um, sort of response to COVID-19. So if it's something that's been, again, ongoing and needs to scale, if it's if there's some reflective that it those clients were impacted by COVID-19 and by your ability to scale or innovate improves those that were most impacted, I think it would be considered. But I really want to be clear that the initial investments around the strategic response fund was to respond to the pandemic. And we want to make sure that under donor intent that we really take this opportunity for some of that innovation that could make things better for those that were most impacted. Am I still on? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah I want to really emphasize that. We've got hundreds of donors to this fund and they've donated to, uh, for the strategic COVID-19, or the Co Delaware COVID-19 Strategic Response Fund. COVID-19 is a critical part of that. So as great as some ideas might be, if they don't have a, a clear COVID nexus as well, then it, we just can't do it because the donors, um, you know, gave for another purpose. Uh, so yeah, spot on. I can't agree more, Cynthia. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so please know, as Cynthia mentioned, she and I are available. The team at the Community Foundation is available. They've done their best to outline all the steps um, for the application process on their website, and. Um, you know, our goal again is is to be a support to you. Um, okay, there's a couple more questions popping in. Um, so, um, yeah, I have a promo across several. Of them. 
So some of these questions, what we might do is just take them offline because they're getting a little more specific. Um, I, I want to thank you all today for being here. Stu, thanks for popping in and, yeah. and uh, joining the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and Cynthia, um, as always, I really value the partnership that Dana and Philanthropy Delaware have. Um, I think that it's helped our community um, be able to bring nonprofits and uh, philanthropy together to, to solve big ideas. Um, again, a couple little promotional plugs. Uh, if you're a nonprofit that was hoping to receive grant and aid, um, the grant and aid bill was not passed in the Senate yesterday. So it's really important to speak to your Delaware Senator um, about the importance of grant and aid for your organization. Second, just a reminder that um, I know we've got a lot of things happening, but it's so important that we remind our volunteers, our board members, our employees, and those we serve that completing the census form for census 2020 is imperative. That's how federal dollars are applied in Delaware. And we want to ensure we have a complete count. Delaware right now is tracking a little bit behind the national average as it relates to self response. And the pandemic certainly made that a lot harder. But um, you can do your part by um, helping to share the word and a reminder that um, there is assistance to help people complete the census they can make a phone call, they can do it online, um, they can do it by the mail or a census employee can assist them. So we've, the government has really tried to make it as easy as possible for folks to complete census and, um, and, and in many different languages as well. Cynthia, any last words that you'd like to offer? Well, first of all, I just wanna thank the nonprofits in the state for the work they've done and how they've responded in these most unique times and how they've pivoted to make sure that their clients did not feel um, lack of service during this process. And secondly, um, again, Sheila said it in the beginning, but I have to remind and reiterate that the funding community um, and the partnership between Dana, Delaware Community Foundation, United Way and Philanthropy Delaware was critical in starting to move dollars. And um, I'm proud to say, you know, we like to say things like we're from the first state, but the collaborative among these four organizations and the um, response of those leaders to move dollars faster than any other state had done in response to COVID-19 is extraordinary. And we couldn't do it without a nonprofits like you putting the money out on the street, but also the funding community and these four core leaders that really right out the gate said, how can we work together to solve this for Delawareans? And I have to say thank you to Stu, Michelle, and Sheila for that. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, again, you've got questions. Don't hesitate to ask. Have a great day.